Even acquiring this general purpose uh, intelligence uh, requires us to model the world, which is very, very difficult. Uh, the environments and the tasks can vary and change. Even uh, basically environments are very non-stationary in the real world. The policy structure might be limited. The optimization solver that we uh, use might be wrong or get stuck in local minima. Uh, the assumptions that we make may not hold or may be holding only in a very, very specific uh, domain. And um, usually in robotics, we try to solve this triad of perception, planning, and control, or else sense, think, and then act, that it is completely separated. Uh, so model-based methods and traditional robotics try to tackle each of these uh, parts separately. But in the end of the day, to achieve intelligence, you need to be somewhere in between and have a system and algorithms that can really integrate everything together so that you can be really reactive, robust, and adaptive. So this is what we hope to do with uh, robot learning. And this is an example of, uh, again, a reinforcement learning algorithms being trained with um, sim to real methods to do extreme parkour um, with trained in simulation and then transferred into the real world. So we can really also do uh, amazing stuff also with learning. So let's see some uh, notations that we'll, uh, we will use later on. You know by now what is a Markov decision process, MDP. We have the state space, the action space A. We may have an observation space O, in, especially in the case that we do not have access to the true state of our environment. We have a transition uh, probability matrix. Uh, we may have an observation uh, model and some reward function. In the case that we have, of course, a strictly Markov decision process, we have only the tuple of the state actions, uh, uh, transitions, and rewards, of course, an initial distribution and so on. And our goal is to learn a policy, a controller, that will uh, give us the optimal action given a state. Uh, but in robotics, usually we are dealing with POMDPs. This is where the observations and the observation model may uh, uh, come in. Where in this case, we only observe part, parts about the environment and we need to infer basically uh, the state. And there are different techniques about how we can go uh, around uh, with it. For example, it can be uh, by some sort of uh, filtering techniques like particle filtering that will give you a belief about the state or very simply uh, adding history into your neural network policy in order to allow the network to understand what is happening actually uh, in the past in order to be able to infer uh, the future. And then infer, of course, the action in your policy. But the whole idea uh, is that we make the Markovian assumption that says that the future is independent of the past given, given the present. Very simply uh, put, uh, the Markovian assumption assumes that your current state is sufficient statistic, so you don't need the history, which uh, I just uh, briefly before said uh, that we may be using the history when we have basically partially observable environments. But in this case, these are the tricks that we do in order to append a POMDP into an MDP problem and solve it with uh, some algorithms that we have, for example, in reinforcement uh, learning. So first, we will focus on imitation uh, learning. And in imitation learning, we have some problems because Markovianity doesn't really uh, hold there. The main idea of imitation learning is to imitate some expert data. So you first need to collect this expert data that they may be observations or states, depends, of course, on the environment that you have, and some action pairs. And then you need to train a function to map these observations or states to uh, those actions that you have collected. And here you can see an example of autonomous driving where we collect uh, sensor um, from our sensors. Here is a camera. We collect um, uh, the data and also the driving uh, from uh, the driving actions from the steering wheel, again with some encoders. And then we train. Ah, it doesn't uh, propagate this thing, apparently. Okay. Then I will use this. Okay. Um, and then basically we train our neural network to, by doing some sort of supervised learning uh, to match the actions of the expert, that it is basically the driver. Uh, it is interesting to see that we were doing deep imitation learning already in 1989 with the first autonomous driving car, the Alvin, uh, being created in uh, CMU. 
And there was again some uh, retina images from the video passed through a deep, okay, not so deep, quite shallow uh, neural network. And, but yeah, this is what it was able to do. This is obviously several times <laughs> accelerated video. It, it, is not, it was not able to go so fast. <laughs> well, not that now, I mean, now we have done some progress in this domain. But also deep imitation learning today looks like this. Uh, there was also some uh, tweet recently about this Aloha Unleashed. Uh, it's a system of teleoperation where you have a master-slave uh, system or a coupled leader-follower system where you have exactly the same arms on your side and you are manipulating them. And then there is the robotic system that basically maps exactly what you do on the system on the other side. And you can do things like here, putting the shoe on, on the human and... Yeah, I mean, it's a promising setting. It's a setting that exists for years because, for example, surgeons do robotic surgery in the same way. Um, and they used it, for example, now uh, for collecting 26,000 data for over a year for s solving five tasks with low success rate. But this is where we are. And we also have uh, new models for uh, learning, for doing imitation. For example, the diffusion policy, that it is a diffusion model and allows us to do things like this, like making a pizza, uh, since we are here in Italy. Uh, we will discuss this, uh, both models, uh, in a while today. Um, but the main uh, point that I will focus today in imitation learning, imitation learning contains uh, different uh, methodologies, uh, but we will focus on behavioral uh, cloning, that it is exactly what I started talking about. Uh, basically, explicitly trying to map the uh, observations or states to the actions that the expert is giving you. Other techniques could be, for example, inverse uh, reinforcement learning, where you try to learn the cost function or like the reward function of the human based on the demonstrations and then do uh, extraction of the policy, but we will just focus on what exactly it says, clone the behavior of an expert. Uh, and the idea, again, is that you have these expert trajectories, you collect them, you do supervised learning, and then you have a policy. Um, so <coughs> how do we do behavioral cloning right now? We use uh, usually observations that are images. In this particular case is this... Uh, Fun track, I think. I don't remember exactly how was the name. It's not Mario Kart. It's a track something uh, paper. This is the Dagger uh, paper. It's this Ross 11A that I also have in the end a list of papers. Um, so you collect the camera images from the game and the steering angle. These are, are the actions, and this is what you want to map to. That it is a range between minus one and one. So if you are zero, you are going straight. And I have like a video here uh, of how a sample of expert trajectory looks like. Uh, so you can imagine how it looks. We collect the data. We have humans playing the game. We collect the data. And then we try to do imitation learning. So um, the problem is that behavioral cloning is not standard supervised learning in the sense of supervised learning for like doing classification, like labeling. Uh, uh, zero one uh, labels. So what, are, what goes wrong here? Already you see that we have, for example, an expert trajectory and the standardly we try to predict the next actions and then we have some errors accumulating and this error take you to a new state that this state, it was not seen before in your data set and then you predict an action that has not been the expert action and so on and then you have this divergence of your learned policy. Um, so let's say just a bit why behavioral cloning is not the standard supervised uh, setting. In the supervised um, setting where, for example, we do classification, we have the IID assumption. We assume that all our uh, data are independent and identically distributed. And also we can uh, see also the theory from supervised learning that tells us that when your um, data and your targets are IID and they are sampled from some uh, distribution, the lower the training error, the, best, the better the test performance uh, will be. However, the uh, data that we have from the, uh, in behavioral cloning, they are not IID. Actually, there is usually a causal relationship about what we see and what we do, and this affects 
uh, everything. Uh, and we have also other problems, like the expert data only contains the good behaviors. We never have seen bad behaviors so that we know how we can react to them. <coughs> Therefore, any small mistake during test time will cause these cascading failures with your uh, policy diverging away from the distribution of the expert. So in the case of behavioral cloning, low training error doesn't necessarily translate into good test performance because these small uh, numerical errors that you might have at the beginning that you are closer to your, to your expert will, start, will continue accumulating up to the point that you will diverge and therefore you will have a domain shift or as we also call it, a distribution shift that uh, we have seen, we see also in other uh, uh, in other domains. And here you can see an example. Here is a domain shift. I don't know if it is very visible. Um, in in uh, uh, in okay, the domain shift is easier to handle in in um, classification. But if you look into the demonstrations where you have also a spatiotemporal relation between the samples, you can see how easy it is uh, to uh, diverge. And in sequential decision making is even worse uh, the problem of domain shift than in, uh, for example, classification. Because it can be fatal and it is quite dynamic. Uh, again, the problems is that the policy is trained only on the expert best data that you have. The expert has also almost zero uh, chance of seeing a bad state because they are experts and usually we throw away all the bad samples when we do behavioral cloning because exactly we want to, be, to clone the good behaviors, not the bad ones. And uh, in general, we can say that imitation learning is cliff walking. Once you do a small you know, uh, step away from your uh, good trajectory, you can fall off, off the cliff. And once you make one mistake, then you are out of your training distribution, and we have this out of distribution uh, shift. And okay, but we could make work, we could make imitation learning and behavioral cloning in particular work if we had um, different types of data. So if we also include more mistakes or, for example, try to correct the mistakes that we have. So uh, one of the approaches uh, that we use is data augmentation. So uh, the first idea is to do this intentionally, intentionally to add mistakes on your uh, trajectories and add the corrections of those mistakes so that you can see this uh, data. Um, so yeah, the, here we say that the mistakes hurt, but the corrections help, so it, it's better than uh, not having at all mistakes. And uh, when we use also data augmentation, so this is the one part on how we can create more data. And the second idea is to just augment the data with synthetic or fake data uh, that uh, illustrate, for example, correction. So you may go and intervene with some way to bring back the trajectory, or you may go to your uh, training trajectories and uh, do uh, specific techniques for adding noise, but still not too much noise so that you go completely you know, outside of the, of the track, considering that you are playing the game. Um, so yes, as I said, uh, data augmentation example kit techniques are, for example, adding uh, noise uh, from some, uh, uh, you have some small Gaussian noise, usually it may come from statistics within the demonstration set. So you have different experts driving with different styles and you can capture, for example, some uh, variance in their behaviors and you can use these in some white noise to uh, add, uh, to augment the data, to create a different uh, types of uh, trajectories also from other um, expert drivers. And uh, yeah, you can see, for example, this is like the noise profile. This was the original trajectory, the green one, and the blue one is the one that you created by perturbing this driving uh, signal of the human. So with this uh, data set now uh, augmentation, we, we, we have an algorithm introduced in 2011, the Dagger uh, algorithm, the data aggregation uh, algorithm, that the main idea was that to correct, the, to, to correct the mistakes that happened during training, you need more data, and who is the best to give you more data? The best is the human, the expert. So the whole idea of Dagger is basically a human in the loop 
learning process where you start initially, you have your data, you do imitation learning, you test your policy, and wherever it diverges, there is a human that it is intervening and collects the correct path. So it intervenes, giving the correct controls for these new states that you visit. And then you collect these new interactions, you add them into your data set. So this is initially, right? First iteration, you get the demonstrations, you train the policy, and now you're, uh, you query your experts in these cases where you diverge, you have new data, and now you add, you aggregate these new data points and actions, basically the observations and actions in your data set. You do a new supervised learning by uh, round, and you have a new policy. You test again, you in the user intervenes, you aggregate even more data, you have a new policy, you do this n times up to the point that you are quite satisfied with the result of your policy. And while Dagger is now a 13-year-old algorithm, it is still used. We still basically rely on humans to collect better quality data, especially when you do imitation learning. And this is basic, uh, a basic strategy of uh, many big tech companies where they are going onto the train of this, uh, let's try to big, build these large scale behavioral cloning uh, models where they have people that they explicitly give new data wherever you are out of distribution and you are keeping, you, you keep your checkpoints and you keep training them till you get a very, very good behavior. But yeah, let's see how this will go because it seems that even with 26,000 uh, data points over a year, as I told you, this Aloha uh, setting was not able to reach in the easy tasks, it went around 70%, in the difficult tasks, 40%. So we have a long way to go. And obviously, our life became better when uh, neural networks uh, appeared because they uh, have the capacity to model way more complex uh, functions and interactions. Um, as I also hinted before, uh, one uh, standard methodology here for doing behavioral cloning, so you have like your um, usually some mean square error or some maximum likelihood estimation, depending whether you train a deterministic policy or whether you are training just a stochastic Gaussian, uh, for example, policy. And because you usually have observations, you usually put a history uh, on your, um, uh, as input on your neural network, and then you have the output of, uh, of the actions. Um, but still, um, co having the human in the loop, as you can imagine, can be quite difficult. And therefore, there are different ways where we can provide data in simulation, for example, and then distill this information into another model that doesn't have the privileged information of the simulator. And then you have basically this teacher-student um, a setting, training setting that does behavioral cloning, um, which seems to work also quite well, also in robotics, as I will show you in a while. So there are two stages in this kind of a process. In the stage one, you have a privileged agent that we call usually teacher that learns from expert data in a simulated environment, like in this case here on, on, on the left part, you can see the privileged agent that imitate, imitates the expert, that it is either a human driving in simulation or rules that you created, so some agent that you have programmed, some AI, that learns to drive according to rules in this simulated environment. You obviously collect some images that you hope that they are quite realistic, and then you uh, train. At, uh, when you are done here, then you have a sensory motor student, right? A sensory motor student, what does it mean? It's a student that only relies on the perception from the sensors and uh, basically its own state, while here you have the exact state of the simulator, but here you don't have it. And this privileged agent tries to match the performance of uh, this, uh, sorry, this uh, student agent tries to match the performance of the teacher, okay? And then you do behavioral cloning between the teacher, the teacher and the student. 
And this is actually a technique that works quite well in robotics, uh, especially because we have this domain gap between simulation and reality. Um, here is a, a paper that had a lot of impact. It's called Learning Quadrupedal Locomotion Over Challenging Terrain. I will show you the video right away after this uh, slide. Um, what I want you to focus on is these uh, first two steps on the left, so the policy training part. Here you can see that on the, um, on the upper part, we have a teacher policy training. And it's actually trained, trained with reinforcement learning. So there is a reinforcement learning environment you create in simulation. You give to this um, policy access to very, very privileged information. For example, here you can see you can get contact forces, uh, contact states, terrain profile, friction coefficients, disturbances, all these things are fed that are basically parameters that you have from your simulator. They are fed into your policy and you do the enforcement learning. And actually, if you see here on the, on the right, to ensure that this policy is actually quite robust, you also use automatic terrain curriculum generation. So they actually play around with these parameters here, the privileged information that change the dynamics of the environment. Right, so they start, for example, with heels, they, they have steps, they have stairs, and they have all these different parameters that they can change. And then the agent can have uh, also some information about the environment. It trains a policy, and then the agent that learns this uh, good locomotion behavior over different types of terrains will get distilled into a student that it is a different agent that only uses the proprioception of the robot. So it only, in this particular case, uses the joint locations and the forces that the agent perceives from its own sensors, not from whatever the simulator it, it, it says. So there are some additional techniques that they do here, for example, matching a latent uh, from the encoder here to the encoder here so that you ensure that you are aligned um, in the physics, basically, that you understand if you want. But in the end of the day, the goal is to imitate, to have actions here that imitate whatever this RL agent has learned during uh, training. And then these actions are fed into some low-level controller, and then the robot goes on. So let's see, for example, here, um, this uh, video. Okay, there is no voice here, but you can see this is an agent that by training it in such a way, so doing RL in simulation with privileged information and adding much variability in the environment, they call it curriculum, it is not exactly curriculum, it's a kind of sampling different environments in different uh, episodes. Regardless, uh, they are able to do sim to real transfer without needing any further training into the real world. And I think that this is uh, amazing. Again, uh, locomotion, especially quadrupedal locomotion, compared to other types of robotic systems, has an advantage of having these four legs being in contact uh, with the environment. So at every time, there are at least two contact points that allow you to have stability. Usually we model this. This agent has been able to learn these things. And you've seen, this is a paper from 2021 already. And they have done even more uh, after this, also with reinforcement learning. But they still use the same teacher-student technique when they go to the real world. Um, yes. So I have been starting, I, I started talking about deep uh, imitation learning, but currently the way that we do imitation learning is by using generative models. And we have tried to do imitation learning with every generative model that existed and was, let's say, the, tr the current trend uh, in, in machine learning. Uh, so we, um, what, of course, I, I can imagine that you know what are generative models, right? They are uh, these types of models that try to learn a distribution uh, 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 theta here that matches the distribution of uh, the data. Ideally, we would like to match the true distribution, but we don't have access to it. And then once you learn this generative model, you sample from it, right? You sample from this uh, distribution and you can potentially get new data that you have not seen 
into the, uh, explicitly in your data set, right? So this is quite powerful, and this is why we like it compared to this uh, more supervised way of learning uh, policies. Um, and as I said, we have uh, used every, every type of generative model from generative adversarial uh, networks, variational autoencoders, diffusion models, um, and also um, normalizing flows that I will not talk uh, about them, but they are also currently quite hot topic uh, in machine learning and also in robotics. So one um, important algorithm in imitation learning with generative models is the generative adversarial imitation learning methodology, or else Gale, uh, where in this particular case, you have uh, three steps that you, uh, that you do. You uh, sample trajectories from uh, students, and then you have a discriminator. I, I suppose you know how the GAN works. You train, uh, write a, generate, a generator model that generates samples, and then there is a, di a discriminator that tries to distinguish whether these uh, samples come from the expert, basically the data set, or that they are fake. And they, they compete against each other because the, gener the generator tries to, um, uh, to make the discriminator believe that the data are the true data, right? So they compete against each other. So how do we do uh, similarly in Yale? You have trajectories from, uh, from the students that you train, and then you have a discriminator which aims to classify the teacher from, from the student or your true data from your uh, learned data. And uh, you train a student policy which aims to minimize the discriminator's accuracy. Um, however, one problem is that, uh, like, can Yale capture multimodal behavior? Uh, the answer is no, because usually it collapses to specific modes. And this is the same also for doing imitation learning with variational autoencoders. And this kind of technique was, uh, became very, very popular because it allows you also to do uh, more easily learning from images, right? So you have a variational autoencoder. Um, it is uh, trained in, with the elbow objective. Um, here is the elbow objective. We cannot, as we said before, we cannot match the, ex the exact distribution, the exact target distribution. We do not have access to it, so we create a different objective where we try to optimize for a lower bound. And basically, it consists of these two uh, terms, the VAE objective, where you try to basically uh, reconstruct the sample. So you have an autoencoder, right? You take the sample, there is encoded in some latent representation, and then you try to reconstruct it. So here is the reconstruction term. And this is an additional KL term that tries to keep the distribution that you try to learn as close as possible to some prior, and usually this prior is some Gaussian distribution or some more elaborate distribution if you can add it. Um, so this VAE uh, structure allows you to give as input, for example, images and output, uh, try to reconstruct these images, and then for example, by sampling um, this uh, latent vector, you can also decode them into, into actions. And this is where this ALOHA system uh, and their um, action chunking with transformers technique uh, comes. And we will see some other examples here. Uh, this is a paper from last year, so this, uh, this results. So as I said, now they are doing even more complex. Uh, they are attempting to do even more complex tasks, so here they they try to change the battery, and on the right, they are cutting the tape, right, and exchange it between the two, uh, the two arms. And all the observations here are coming from, um, from images. There are four cameras observing the environment. There is a top-down camera. There are cameras on the end effectors, and there are additional other cameras uh, playing uh, an additional camera looking at the system, so one on the top, one looking at the system, and two on each of the end effectors. Uh, long story short, here they created a conditional variational autoencoder where there is a transformer uh, structure, so the network is not just convolutional network as in the standard uh, VAEs that we were using, but it's a, actually a transformer encoder decoder that tries to predict um, the next action, and this is the difference 
of this action chunking. Action chunking is actually a, um, a technique coming from, uh, not a technique actually, it's an observation from cognitive science about the way that humans do inferences. So it says that you don't only consider your next action at the next time step, but you usually have a chunk of actions that you predict that you're going to do into the future. So you say, uh, usually, you, 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 I will wake up, I will go to brush my teeth, I will make a coffee. So all these are actions without you considering the intermediate states. Uh, so this is exactly what they do. So they train this uh, conditional variational autoencoder to um, predict an ensemble. So they query it multiple times and for different time horizons. And then they aggregate and they take the average of this and they play out the first action of it. And then you feed back the action and the new observations that you have, and you predict the next. So this is how this works, and it works quite well for their setting. It's easy to apparently to overfit some specific parameters, but again, it doesn't really capture much of the multimodality of many of these actions. And I guess this is also a problem of why this Aloha system with this specific model cannot go beyond a, a specific percentage of success rate. In my lab, we also have used uh, these uh, types of variational um, autoencoders, but for learning a uh, mixture of experts. Um, also, to, because our, our goal was to capture uh, multimodality, so we are explicitly conditioning our variational autoencoder to learn different modes by having this uh, uh, mixture of experts uh, system and we do human-human robot interaction. So uh, in particular, in this case, we learn from human-human demonstrations. So we have two humans demonstrating us how to do handovers. We train an initial model to encode the trajectory of the human that it is uh, basically your partner. And then this conditions an additional variational autoencoder that reconstructs uh, robot actions, and this becomes the controller in order to do these experiments that you uh, have seen uh, here, some examples. So yeah, these systems are quite powerful, especially if you can uh, really um, structure them well. Of course, they have a lot of hyperparameters, but currently the uh, huge boom in imitation learning, and not only in imitation learning, is doing imitation learning with diffusion models. I think that you have seen diffusion models, um, but yeah, very, very briefly, when we, when we have a diffusion model, we have a forward uh, noising process, and then we do the refer reverse diffusion in, in order to remove this noise, and this is exactly what we are trying to learn. What is this function that does the, the denoising? I will sk uh, skip this part, but uh, one uh, paper that really uh, uh, appeared last year. I think oh, this is not playing. One second. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, one paper that appeared last year, for example, the diffusion policy uh, paper uh, has investigated the use of the diffusion model for learning direct actions to apply uh, on robots. And here on the top part, you see the discrimination of different techniques for doing imitation learning. On the left, you see the explicit policy, which is exactly this behavioral cloning um, methodology that we have seen so far. So you have observations, there is a policy, and this maps to actions. And usually, these uh, can be very restricted in the representation that it can give you. It can be just a single Gaussian. It can be a mixture of Gaussian, but it is quite difficult to not collapse to the different modes, so you need good regularization. It can be a categorical distribution, just you know, pick, place, and it just learns to categorize. Another way of training policies is with energy-based models. So you have an implicit uh, function that takes uh, observations and actions and gives you basically a, a value and then an energy landscape, and from that you can extract the best action that you can take but they are very hard to train, the energy-based models. And finally, we have the diffusion policy that instead of giving you the energy, it gives you the gradient of the energy, so one layer higher if you want. And we have a gradient field that gives you towards where should I go in order to take the optimal action. And then you integrate this uh, with just Newton, for example, integration, and you take the 
exact action that you need to, to play out. So the model that they use uh, takes in some uh, observations from cameras, a history of observations, and it goes through a network that learns this noising um, function. The difference to original uh, diffusion models is that now you don't have only just the images as input, you also have actions, and the K is the diffusion uh, step. Uh, and then you run, you, you do inference k times, uh, depending on how many steps you want to diffuse. And they also tested different types of architecture, CNN-based and transformer-based architecture. In their initial work, the CNN-based was working better, uh, just because in the transformer-based they were collapsing everything to single tokens, so there was not much uh, to learn from the cross-attention. But now uh, transformer-based methods work much better. Uh, in my group, we also have done para in parallel work um, by appending and lifting, in some sense, if you want, diffusion models into the 3D space of uh, 3D positions and 3D orientations for learning um, how to grasp objects and also how to uh, create the whole trajectory that takes you to grasp optimally an object and then place it, for example, in different environments. In this case, we used point-based representations, not images, and we were training internally a neural uh, representation, an SDF, a sign distance field, to try to capture on the latent space the 3D model of the object and to be able then to, uh, to do these 3D trajectories that we generate. This brings me to the end of imitation learning, and we am already 48 minutes in. I think in the RL I will not spend so much time. But yeah, I would like to hear some questions, like for two, three questions if you have. Don't be shy. <laughs> if there are no questions, I will continue with the the RL part. Okay, I will continue. So, imitation learning is not enough, and in particular for re robotics, it's not enough because the world the world is huge. You need experts, humans, to collect this data. It is very very difficult. Even if you need to do reinforcement learning to create experts, you need people that they know how to create environments and reward functions and everything for every possible situation. The real world is very non-deterministic, um, uh, it's very non-stationary, and it's quite expensive to have humans in the loop all the time to judge you and give you uh, new data. And yeah, these data are not enough for super intelligence. So ideally, we want these AI, embodied AI systems, to be able to learn autonomously. Here on the top, you see this mobile Aloha. So they actually put this uh, teleoperation system on a mobile base, and you wear it with the wheels, and you walk around with this whole system. And you can imagine it's not very, very convenient. And yeah, I mean, still, it seems like people try to push on uh, like collect more data if it is not working, collect more data till the extrapolation becomes interpolation, train test on the same day so basically don't sleep. So I think it's a bit uh, too much. And like I really, we really, I really think that it's somewhere in between learning from demonstrations from a few da data and then uh, refine your skills. And I think this is what robots should also do. So, okay, the goal of RL is to maximize this cumulative uh, discounted uh, reward, what we call return, and from this distill an optimal policy on how to act. I'm going to skip these things. I hope you all know by now what is a value function, an action value function, what is the optimal one, and how we can extract optimal policies. You have seen Q learning, so I will go directly to deep Q learning that try to uh, use deep neural networks as function approximators in order to learn how to act. Um, so DQN was introduced, yeah, 11 years ago by DeepMind, and it, uh, cre it demonstrated superhuman uh, performance in the Atari, uh, in the Atari games. Uh, there are many improvements and extensions after what we call DQN network. Um, these are the types of games that it was, it learned to uh, to solve, 
And the difference here compared to tabular Q learning that you have seen probably also yesterday is that you have as input images and usually you take like four frames and you give as input to a network and your outputs are discrete actions. So the deep Q network is uh, something that looks like this. It takes as input uh, four frames. It has some convolutional uh, layers that process these images and then there is some uh, f uh, fully connected layers that then decode uh, Q values for every possible action. So let's say that you have four actions, you will have four outputs that are the Q of these uh, four actions and you take the one, the action that has the maximum Q, okay? I will not go through the way that we do the exploration. There is an epsilon greedy doing the exploration, trying to balance the exploration exploitation. There are tricks that were introduced to make this algorithm work and be stable, like the replay buffer where you are storing uh, the experience that you have um, en encountered so far, both the good and the bad experiences, so that you can train this Q function that really learns to discriminate which policies are good to follow and which are bad. Um, and also there is a, a target network that cre creates your uh, a learning target, if you want, that is just a version of your network that you uh, do not update so often, because this is one of the problems in reinforcement learning, that you don't really explicitly have labels. You have to create your labels from the cues that you approximate, and this may, if you update the same cue that you are learning from, makes the training very unstable. So target networks that were introduced in order to make the uh, training more stable. And it's just a version of your network that you had some uh, training uh, steps before, for example. It's just like that. And with a lower rate, you just copy the parameters of your current network to this target network, and you continue on with this optimization. In robotics, how does Q-learning uh, can be applied? Uh, it can be applied and was applied quite thoroughly in uh, some environments that were tabletop, as we call them, where you have just a single camera on the top, and basically um, you create these action maps, action value maps, that you can see also here, which are just Q values, and you assume that the robot will change the state of the pixels in the image. So if the robot goes and changes and pushes, for example, in this particular case, a box, the box will move, so the pixels in the image will change. So this is supposed to be an action. Or, for example, an, uh, uh, another uh, use case where Q-learning has been extensively used is grasping, even, yeah, it's, it is grasping, where the MDP is basically framed inside the image because otherwise it's just... Uh, a bandit, that you go there, you grasp something and you take it out. But if you frame it on the image space, when you select something that has the maximum value to grasp, you change the image, you change the state of the image because then you removed something so the pixel value there will change, okay? So this is a discretized space because your, your uh, image has a very specific size and every pixel is a possible action to, to do. And this is why it can be solved with Q-learning. So it's uh, not a continuous action problem. And here is an example of naive my mobile manipulation, if you want. So the robot had to uh, perceive and move these uh, uh, boxes into different locations, probably take them here on, on the target. Um, and yeah, do different configurations. Actually, they had a lot of different um, variations of this problem. But as you can imagine, in high degrees of freedom robots, like high dimensional uh, like humanoids or even just a single arm, you have to control a lot of different parts of the robot. So this is not very useful because we need to do continuous control. And this is where we go to these uh, actor critic methodologies uh, that allow us to do uh, to train policies for continuous actions and really uh, be able to control the joints of the robots that have can take continu uh, continuous values. 
Now, this is a rough taxonomy of model free RL. You can find this was taken from the OpenAI blog on speed up RL. Uh, so we have the discrimination of the value-based method, that is this, for example, DQN method that learns explicitly just the Q function, and from that you extract the policy by taking the, the actions that maximize the Q. You have policy gradient methods that you have seen yesterday, and then you have these actor-critic methods where you both estimate a Q function, but you also uh, learn a policy, and you try to continuously improve this policy using the Q function that you that you that you learn, um, and one uh, there are many algorithms. So it started with uh, let's say DDPG TT3, but uh, the one that really made a difference, especially for robotics, was soft actor critic. I don't give you the mathematical details here because it's very involved, but you can really look into the paper. Uh, I have also the links in the end of the tutorial. Um, so again, it's an actor critic uh, framework. Uh, the actor is the policy network and the critic, it's basically the Q function that evaluates uh, how good is the action. Uh, there are two versions of this paper. This is the first one. In the second one, there was a value function here. In the second one, there was IQ function. The important thing about SAC is that there was a soft objective uh, that allows this um, methodology, this algorithm, to explore with maximum entropy. So basically, it tries to do many random actions especially in the beginning of the process that it doesn't have any data, to try to explore as much as possible the environment, and then uh, tries to update the policy, but it always reg reg regularizes for this, um, how basically random should I remain while I am training my policy, such that you don't collapse to a very specific uh, mode of behavior, let's say, of the environment. Uh, so it really uh, tries to balance this exploration exploitation with this soft objective, as we call it. Um, and it gives you stochastic policies. So it gives you basically Gaussian uh, policies that has a bit of uh, randomness, that it is quite good in some cases where you want to escape from local, uh, from, uh, local minima. Uh, so this is also an algorithm that we have also used in our lab for doing mobile manipulation and deciding uh, where the robot has to move to and when should, they act, should the robot activate the arm in order to uh, do and manipulate different objects. Um, it has, of course, other techniques inside. It's not just the application of soft, soft actor critic here, but it is based on this uh, algorithm. Um, in robotics, like this is why I wanted to uh, say a bit about this, it is not only about which algorithms we have to use. Sometimes, you may take an algorithm and it might work directly on your environment, but sometimes you may have to intervene because you may don't want to explicitly, for example, control every part of the robot. Or you may want to blend to create like hybrid decision-making algorithms that integrate what you know about the robot because you have knowledge from the hardware and the model of the robot, and then have another part that basically describes what you don't know about the world, which is very difficult to model, and then is, this is where model-free methods are very, very useful. Useful. Another important algorithm, and this is coming to the, to the, towards the end, so bear with me, it's proximal policy optimization, or else PPO. It's very, very popular. Um, it trains a policy over an advantage function. Uh, the advantage is the difference of uh, the value function and the Q. And uh, what it does, it tries to update the policy uh, by not changing too much compared to your previous policy. So it introduces some sort of clipping method so that it doesn't make too big updates on the way that it uh, updates the policy parameters, and it very effectively trades off exploration exploitation. It has been used uh, in, let's say, game-like environments like this lunar lander setting, but also a very um, important approach. Uh, it was a result of uh, sim to real is this finger gating from OpenAI from 2018 already. But PPO, which was an algorithm that was based on TRPO that was from 2015, if I'm not wrong. PPO must have been 2016, if I'm not wrong. It's still very relevant for robotics, especially because now powered by 
powerful simulators like Isaac, uh, Isaac Jim, uh, it is able to train in parallel thousands of robots. This is cut out, I'm sorry. It was supposed to, yeah, okay. It's supposed to grasp it and go to the goal. Or maybe they are just the progresses of different episodes now. Uh, so we can create this kind of like factory of robots that run in parallel in thousand and they all use kind of PPOs and their underlying um, uh, RL agent that learns in parallel from all the data that you collect from all these parallel simulations. The difficulty here is to define the environment and define the reward functions. It really is extremely painful to do this. It's one of the diffi most difficult parts. So on the one hand, you need to try to understand, okay, what do I control from my robot? And then you have to define also the environment and the reward functions uh, such that it makes sense and that it is also transferable in the real world. Uh, here is, an, for example, an example of a PPO being used on uh, uh, navigation with high-speed legged uh, locomotion, where you don't necessarily explicitly control the robot itself, but you may give, for example, waypoints and small trajectories uh, for passing through the environment. Again, we have here uh, the animal robot that we saw before. Um, so uh, this was a very uh, simple approach. They used, again, Isaac Jim. They uh, had like thousands of parallel environments with different terrains, and they are able to train the robot to walk from scratch in 20 minutes. And they, I don't, let me see if it is in this video, but they actually, okay, uh, you can actually, we have seen this robot being trained in front of our eyes. Uh, in 20 minutes in conferences, for example. So it started from a point that it cannot really stand. And then every time it was updating the policy, it was able to stand better and then start walking. And then in 20 minutes, it's able to like go over stairs and so on. So it's really, really impressive that you can do with parallelization and very, very good uh, um, simulators. Here, the simulators that are closer to the real world really, really help us. So yeah, one thing is the reward function, but really having good simulators that can kind of go close to the dynamics of the real world is really important. Other applications of PPO is here, for example, Dexter's manipulation uh, from point clouds, uh, opening doors, but still it's quite challenging for manipulation to arrive to the level of uh, locomotion. And what's next? What is the next frontier? The next frontier, at least, from me, from my point of view, are um, reinforcement learning methodologies with diffusion policies. This is a work that uh, we introduced recently, where we train policies online uh, with reinforcement learning um, by trying to discover all the different behavioral modes or all the different ways that you can solve a problem and then distill them inside a diffusion policy and keep updating and training the diffusion policy just with reinforcement learning. So yeah, this brings me to an end. Sorry for the RL part being so fast, but I'm happy to take questions. And in the end, as I said, the two last slides that you got have different references for you to read if you are interested.